Mushu awaken. Model needs my protection, great ancestor. You just say the word and I'm there. Mushu. And let me say something. Anybody who's foolish enough to threaten our family, vengeance will be mine. <laughs> Mushu. <laughs> These are the family guardians. They protect the family. And you, oh demoted one. I bring the gong. That's right. Now. Wake up the ancestors. One family reunion coming right up. Okay, people, people, look alive. Let's go. Come on, get up. Let's move it. Rise and stand. Oh, way past the beauty sleep thing. Trust me. Today, we are with Tom Bancroft, the CEO and founder of Pencilish Animation Studios, the world's first crowdfunded animation studio. Tom is a 30 year veteran of the animation industry. And his work includes Disney classics such as The Lion King, Pocahontas, Mulan, and Mary Poppins Returns. Tom, thank you for your time and welcome to 15 Minutes With. <laughs> thank you, Michael. And I'm going to start off right off the bat and, and correct you. And here's why. I have a twin brother. We were both animators and we both worked at Disney for many years. So what you did, I have heard so many times, which is you gave me one of his credits. <laughs> so oh. I, I did not work on Mary Poppins Returns. That was my brother. Um, you could have said Tarzan or, or Beauty and the Beast. I worked on those also. But uh, we do have a lot of overlap in our Disney days. You know, we both okay. worked on Mulan and, and Lion King. And so anyway. It's and your fun. brother is Tony. Is that correct? Did yeah, I get Tony that Bancroft. right? Bancroft. Yeah, he was the uh, co-director of Mulan um, and also did Pumbaa and Lion King and things like that. But so we were both at Disney for about 12 years. And so there's a lot of people confuse our characters you know who did wait oh wait, tom did mushu okay and tony did pumba yeah so it's that kind of a thing <laughs> um yeah I, I got a question about um working with tony a little bit later i'm excited to hear how that relationship uh, went and i think it went very well so um <laughs> You've been in the animation industry for over 30 years and mm -hmm. with most of that time at Walt Disney Feature Animation Studios. While there, you brought to life some of the most memorable characters in animation history. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. Well, it was definitely a second golden age and we didn't know it. Nobody knows it when you're going through it, but it's certainly looking back, it was. Um, so it was one film after another. I got there right as I was an intern during The Little Mermaid. I have an affinity because I didn't get to work on that movie, but I was surrounded by it. I got to watch it being made around me as an intern. And so uh, that's always been a special film for me for that reason. Um, and uh, so I started doing The Little Mermaid back in 1989. And, but so then that, be, that went right into, um, you know, Beauty and the Beast. And before that, Rescuers Down Under. And then Beauty and the Beast was the first film I animated on. And then um, went into Aladdin and I animated Yago and some of Jafar and then Lion King um, and I did Young Simba and that was a blast. And then went right into Pocahontas and I did Pocahontas, the main character, uh, and then went into uh, Mulan and did Mushu and then a little bit of Tarzan, a little bit of Atlantis, a few others. Um, but what a it was such a fantastic thing to be able to get Mushu finally after about 10 or so years at Disney, because I was primed and ready to do the best work of my life. And I'm still pretty proud of that character. You know, I look at young Simba and I know yeah. that movie for me resonates because my son was um, a young child at the time that that movie came out. Yeah. So I get chills on my arms just thinking about it and, and knowing that I'm talking to you right now. It's like unbelievable. So <laughs> what an honor. <laughs> well, thank you. And I was having kids at the same time. And so I'm, I'm that dad also. It's weird to have worked on those movies, but then bringing home the VHSs and I didn't have to buy them. They gave them to us. You know, we worked on <laughs> yeah. them. And so it was nice to, we really did surround our kids with Disney stuff during those years. I know the whole world did, but you know, Disney stores were big at the time too. And so yeah, we were all uh, buying that stuff like crazy and, and littering our kids' rooms with it because it was <laughs> you know, a shared experience that we all loved too. Wow, Disney, you know, you did work on 10 animated feature films, including those classics, you know, Beauty yeah. and the Beast, Lion King, Aladdin, Milan. 
And, um, you know, reflecting back on it now, um, you know, I know going through it, it had been so exciting. But now with that perspective of time, what does it mean to you today? Oh, yeah. I mean, it means a lot. There's no doubt about it. Um, you know, I still get people coming up to me and I do conventions and I'll be behind <laughs> the desk and, you know, signing things or, or, you know, selling my new art book or whatever it is. And that's where I really get to meet people a lot that will come up to me with tears in their eyes and saying how these Disney films affected them. And I was, you know, I, I, I take, you know, I say thank you, but I don't take all that credit. There were so many people that worked on those films, you know, a, a Disney movie, it was hundreds of people working on this. So I had my part in that, but, you know, so when they specifically say, I like this scene and it was one I animated, you know, that's extra special for sure. Um, because I feel like, okay, I directly kind of affected that person, but yeah, the movies in general, just being, even just being a small part of every film, uh, and, and some of them, it was smaller, especially first starting out like rescuers down under, I feel like I had a very small part in that, but, um, but even that I, it was still a year of life. You know, I remember comp contributing and everybody was contributing. We were a big team creating this thing that we just wanted to get out there and find out how people would see it. I feel for the people that are releasing films now with theaters closed and they don't get that big moment where you finally, I mean, I would work on things where I would animate a scene with Simba and it, I was like, okay, this is going to get a laugh. I had to wait a year for that laugh. Right. <laughs> and so with Mushu especially like uh, he was doing all kinds of gags and we were trying to get people to laugh and he was the comic relief. And, I had to wait over a year for that laugh and to not ever get that it just to, if it was released on Netflix or something like that nowadays and everybody's in their houses watching it, uh, you don't get to hear that laugh. And I, I'm heartbroken for the, the, especially the, the delivery nowadays of, of content. It's great. More people see things than ever before. It's just, we're all seeing it sort of separately. We're not sharing that experience as much. And yeah, it the, takes to me, it definitely takes something away from the experience because I, I do love being in the theater. And mm -hmm. um, you did touch on teens, and that was my next question, which leads me into your twin brother, Tony. Yeah. Um, and he is also an animator, and a, you know, you two have worked closely together in the past. And mm -hmm. so, twofold question you know, what, what's it like working with your brother? And what's it part, what's it like being part of? a team working on an animated film because as you've said there are more than just a few people working on these and uh, i don't think the average consumer of the content realizes that right um they don't i mean if we do our job right especially in the disney days when we we're hand drawing these animated films if we did our job right you, it looked like one person did the whole thing right <laughs> and so we were we were disguising our art our styles, our individual styles and, and, and kind of making it go down one road to make it look like the same character, every shot, every drawing. And so that is the teamwork part that really Disney was n best known for, whether we knew it or not, right. Is that we really kind of uh, streamlined our own individuality into this film, but out of love. I mean, it wasn't like, mm -hmm. Oh, we're dumbing down our abilities or any of that. It was more, we really wanted to make that character be a, you know, a, a whole character and not be distracted by like, Oh, now he looks weird. Or now it's, he looks different. You know, we had to do that so that you, it was one performance, but through thousands of hands. Right. And that's teamwork to, to believe it or not, that is teamwork at, at its best, I think. Um, and so, yeah, working with my brother, the fun thing was, is I was on oftentimes in the same movie working on different characters. So Tony, Lion King's a good example. I'm doing Young Simba and Tony is animating Pumbaa. And we had a couple of sequences uh, where the two characters would interact. And so it was fun to be able to, and li literally I was in the Florida studio, he was in the California studio. So we're working on the same film, 3000 miles apart on the same scenes even. And he would go first maybe and do Pumbaa on the left side of the screen, talking to Simba on the right side of the screen, but he's not there of course. And then he would literally mail those drawings, the stack of drawings across the country. This is how we did it back in the old days, not anymore, but in the old days. <laughs> and I would get those stack and then I would uh, put a blank piece of paper uh, um, over his on uh, every single frame and draw Simba listening and then reacting to what Pumbaa just said. 
And it wasn't until you put them both together and shot it together that it create that performance of these two characters interacting. Uh, so, where you from? Who cares? I can't go back. Ah, oh, you're an outcast. That's great. So are we. What'd you do, kid? Something terrible, but I don't want to talk about it. Good. We don't want to hear about it. Come on, Timon. Anything we can do? Not unless you can change the past. You know, kid, in times like this, my buddy Timon here says you gotta put your behind in your past. No, no, uh, no. I mean... Amateur. Lie down before you hurt yourself. And to think that it was happening 3,000 miles apart and, you know, on separate pieces of paper and different two different people doing it. Yeah, uh, the twin mind did help, I would think, uh, during those, <laughs> those challenging times. When did you know you wanted to become an animator? It's a good question. Um, okay, so I started a little bit different path. So again, this was back in the, um, I, I graduated high school in 85. So back in the, the mid to late 80s, I, was, I knew I wanted to be a cartoonist. I had done comic strips for the school newspaper and things like that. Um, and I loved illustration. So I figured I would do some of that too. Uh, but animation, even though I watched all the Disney movies and things like that, what really wasn't on my sort of vision board because uh, back in those days, we didn't see a lot of the behind the scenes like you see nowadays, like, uh, and it lives on YouTube like crazy. <laughs> you can research like crazy, you know, any kind of anime film and how it was made and things like that. Well, people didn't really talk about that back in those days before Beauty and the Beast, especially you really didn't hear much. And so, um, I thought you needed millions of dollars and, and a huge staff to make anything, even a little short piece of animation. Mm -hmm. And so uh, then it came along a friend of mine in, in junior college, and he was also doing comic strips on the school newspaper with my brother and I, and he showed us this little stop motion animated film he made. And it was just him in his bedroom with his family and they're trying to wake him up. It was, you know, really clunky and, and not, you know, very funny and, and, and well done. It was a sort of a student film but he'd done it by himself and he'd done it with a super eight camera where you could just do one frame at a time. And we saw that. And that was when the light went on of like, we got to try this. And so we did an animated film with him, um, uh, a little like music video. We went pretty grand right off the bat with lip sync and the whole bit didn't know how to do any of it, had to go to the library and find books and things like that and research it on our own. Um, but it took us about two or three months and we created this little short film and by the end of that, we were hooked. As soon as we saw that first film come back, because you had to send it out, wait a few days, have it come back. As soon as we fought, saw our first animation of the characters moving at, around, we were just, okay, that's it. And so we found out about CalArts. California Institute of the Arts was not very far from us in California where we were living. And that was where Disney, uh, they, Disney actually started that school to, to raise up animators for Disney, but all, also other studios. And so we found out about it and we, we got into CalArts and the rest was kind of history from there. Do you ever think that you'd work on films that would gross over $3 billion in total worldwide? That's, <laughs> I, know that's, I know the answer to that, but... Yeah, no, certainly not. <laughs> you know, it's funny because I, my very first job out of CalArts was Disney, right? So I got uh, into a Disney internship, like I said, back in uh, 1989 with The Little Mermaid. And I'd only gone to CalArts about a year and a half. So it was, it all happened very fast and it was good timing. They would, they'd released Who Framed Roger Rabbit already. And that was starting to get the people interested or reinterested in animation. And then of course, when the little mermaid came out, I was already an employee of Disney and, and living in Florida at the new studio. They had just opened and making a Roger Rabbit short, but little mermaid took off immediately plans changed. We were going to make Mickey mouse and Roger Rabbit shorts out of that studio but immediately they were like, no, 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 we're going to up our, 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 you know, films and put out more a year. And so therefore the Florida studio became like a big part of that. It was perfect timing uh, for both Disney and me to, to be in that studio. And so immediately we got thrown into rescuers down under and then beauty and the beast. And by Lion King, we were doing big chunks of the film. Like, you know, that whole can't wait to be King sequence was all done in Florida. Um, and so, that, of course, then uh, led to us then uh, uh, Mulan was the very first film that was completely done in Florida. And then, of course, uh, Lilo and Stitch was done there um, and Brother Bear. So those three were done completely in Florida. So it was a 
great time to be there. And, um, and yeah, looking back, yeah, of course that led to billions of dollars, but also films that are still around and they're, I, I cannot believe, and I'm so excited whenever a really bad, you know, live action version comes out <laughs> of, uh, of a remake of one of those films, not all of them are bad, but you know, some of them, um, it still gets people to go back to the original. And that's what I like about the remakes. If that question was coming up, I will say, I love the remakes because it gets people to still talk about the original and compare and do whatever. And some may beat, I don't know, but at least it gets people talking about the originals. So they're still around. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here talking to the gentleman who created young Simba <laughs> and, you know, what was it like working on that film? And did you, you know, expect it to become the worldwide hit that's still making new fans today? Well, no, it, it, at Disney at the time, and maybe you've heard this story because it's been told a few times, you know, Pocahontas looked like it was going to be the hit. We were making them at the same time. And I'm actually one of the few animators that worked on both. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, because we had two different teams. And so I was fortunate that um, I got to work on Pocahontas and on, uh, on uh, Young Simba. Uh, and so it was weird to have those going on at the same time, but it was really two different teams. Like I said, there were some people that overlapped, but um, we kind of were in competition with each other and, and it looked like Pocahontas was the front runner. It had a lot of the heavy hitter animators, the people that had been there for a long time. Um, and Lanking had a lot of the new guys that including my brother on Pumbaa. Um, and so just nobody expected it to, but I think you, when you're number two, you kind of put more love into it and, and more passion and long nights. And that was definitely Lion King. Um, Pocahontas would kind of went a lot smoother, right? It went through the pipeline kind of smooth because it had a lot of real veteran people on it. And it was just, you know, beautiful to look at, but it maybe didn't have all the story heart that uh, Lion King had. And so I think we just, so that's why we didn't see Lion King coming out and being a billion dollar film and outperforming Pocahontas. And, but believe me, we all wanted both to do well, and especially me, because I worked on both. But, uh, but yeah, the Lion King just, just came out of nowhere and, and everybody loved it. And, and it was as soon as we saw that first trailer, you know, Disney did a really smart thing they'd never done before. I don't know if you remember the very first trailer for Lion King, but it was they didn't do like a lot of clips and all that. And here's some funny parts and all that. They just released the very first song that, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, and lifting up Simba as a baby uh, when Rafiki does that and all the characters, all the oh. animal kingdom, you know, roars. Like that song and that moment was the very first thing that everybody saw in the whole wide world of Lion King. And that really kind of made people just go, Oh my gosh. And it ends with a bump yeah, right yeah. at the end. And if you were in the theater, when you saw that, and you probably were, um, you, you remember that moment and you remember yeah. going, Oh wow. I got to see this movie. I looked at my wife. I'm like, we're going to that movie. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, as soon as we saw it, it's like, I was hooked. I'm in, I didn't know anything but, else about and the it movie. Hooked adults more than it did uh, kids. And that's what made that film a billion dollar film where they went back and back and back seeing that film, much like what we saw later on with frozen because it, it hit, yeah. you, it hit adults just as far, hard as it did kids. You know, where can we find you and pencilish on social media and how can prospective investors find you? Yeah, so the, the easiest place for Pencilish and investors to find Pencilish is to go to wefunder.com backslash Pencilish. Maybe even an even easier way is just to go to Pencilish.com and, and there's a, a link there to the WeFunder. So Pencilish.com is probably the easiest. And the WeFunder is, is, is the sort of the Kickstarter kind of, it's the umbrella. It's, it's how we're, we're creating the investment through that, that website. So there's other companies, of course, on WeFunder. So that's where our page is to invest. And you can see a video from me and all the, the uh, read more about our uh, advisory board and, and just what we want to do and things like that. And of course, invest there also. Uh, for me personally, I'm on Instagram, Tom Bancroft, the number one. And I'm also on Twitter, uh, Tom Bancroft one. Um, and of course, Facebook, my brother and I, we have a podcast. And so that's at the Bancroft Brothers Animation Podcast. 
you can find that on Apple Podcasts and on Spotify and a bunch of different places. Um, and so, yeah, those are the, the main places, Instagram and my podcast. And then of course, pencilish.com. Yeah. I've followed you on Instagram and the podcast is next on my hit list. So I can't oh, wait. Please. Yeah. I think you're going to enjoy it. We interview industry vets, but also people that like uh, Netflix just released the Mitchells versus the machines. And so we had the producers and the directors on, we do all the new stuff and talk to vets about the old days too. Looking forward to it. And Tom, thank you so much for your time. I have one more question for you. Yeah. And my last question is this. If you had one piece of advice um, for other aspiring animators, what would that be? Um, you put the work in. I, I, I hate to say it, uh, something that is boring is that, you know, but, you know, a lot of people will say, follow your dreams and, you know, and all that. But, <laughs> I think we live in a world where we've all been told to follow our dreams plenty of times. And what I see more than not are people following dreams, but not doing the work. And so put the work in, make your dreams a reality by making goals and putting the time in to be a professional, to, to know your job and know it well and tell good stories and create characters that come to life. And that only comes from doing the research and doing the work. You can't just have a dream and have it be entertaining and good and something that people want to watch for years to come. Absolutely. And Tom, thank you so much. I'm thank thrilled you, to even have the opportunity to do this interview. I'm just, about, you know, not just saying that. This is a thrill for me. Well, appreciate I appreciate it. that, Michael. Thank you so much. I enjoyed talking with you too.